first off, I don't uh, like to disagree with the chair, but one of the things that I should make very clear is, first off, I'm not a stutterer, and second, I'm not a therapist either. So there are lots and lots of other people out there who are very, very well qualified uh, and better qualified than me in certain aspects. My particular as thing that I'm good at, I think, is uh, research. Um, just a little bit of background into the King's Speech, in case there's anyone here who hasn't uh, seen the film. It focuses on George VI's uh, speech, uh, stuttering in and around sort of the 1940s, 50s, when the war was taking place, and also his brother's abdication. And it deals with the topic of treating stuttering by Lionel Logue. I think it's important to say that, because Logue was not a, didn't have a formal training as a therapist, and he very much did things, you know, sort of hands-on. And I think since that time up to now, there's been quite a lot of advancement in terms of what we understand about stuttering. What is very clear from the films I've put down here is that Logue and George VI had uh, really very intense relationships. I just want to start off with some general remarks about what we mean by stuttering and the particular sort of focus that I'll take in my talk. Um, we tend to think in the West that it is a speech disorder. And as a speech disorder, we'll be looking for signs and symptoms in the speech. Now, that's not shared by all cultures. And I put down here reference to a recent chapter that... Uh, deals with the situation of animist societies, uh, where if you were brought up in parts of Africa, for example, uh, you would, if you stuttered, you would be considered to be possessed by a devil, and that would lead you to be treated in a particular sort of way. So it's very different from dealing with the speech symptoms. It's also true even in the West that a lot of people sort of deal with uh, consider that they stutter, but don't show any external signs and the so-called covert stuttering. As I say, though, a main feature of most research in the West is about the speech characteristics. And I've put you up a representative list here of what people, what was considered in the late 50s as being the representative signs and symptoms of stuttering. I won't go through all of these, uh, just pick out a few to mention. Phrase repetitions, you can see the examples yourself in the, in the morning. Whole word repetitions, I'll say a little bit more about. And the features at the bottom, prolongations, broken words, etc. On the right, though, what I've shown is that the types of words that the stutters occur on tend to differ between uh, some of the classes. So, for example, if you do a whole word repetition, it tends to happen on the relatively simple parts of speech, what we call the function words, like the conjunctions or the pronouns. Whereas if you look at, do some of the symptoms at the bottom of the list, like prolongations, they'll happen on nouns, verbs, those sorts of things, things we call uh, content words. Just want to say a little bit about position of work at uh, UC and the uh, relevance of recent sort of healthcare sort of uh, healthcare issues as well. Uh, UC took over National Hospitals College of Speech Science and brought over the stuttering expert sort of some 30 or so years ago. My particular sort of interest as a psychologist was I discovered the uh, frequency altered feedback, the FAF effect which is an essential component in many feedback devices. And currently, we're the only UK institution that's offering talk courses. And we're going to offer a, a, a continuing professional development uh, course uh, next year. That's there. Anyone who wants to take a handout sort of can uh, have one after the talk's finished. Also, I just wanted to mention a couple of sort of more general issues to do you know, sort of with uh, stuttering in, in the context of wider sort of issues too. And recently, Malcolm Grant you know, sort of was asked to chair the NH Commissioning Board. Uh, and basically what that means is we're going to be moving over from uh, having services on demand to having services which were actually supplied you know, sort of, uh, and paid for you know, sort of by local health authority trusts. A second thing, a government sort of initiative, 
is the early child matters. I mean, that, you know, so the plans are to screen children at two and a half and again at age five for a whole range of different disorders, you know, sort of including uh, language disorders. And I'll say a little bit about that time permitting sort of later on too. I wanted to mention, I mentioned the FAF effect the, that's used in a lot of uh, commercial devices. And a lot of people talk about this and never actually seen it demonstrated. So I wanted to demonstrate it and also at the same time demonstrate the FAF effect, I should say, and also at the same time point out some important sort of properties of that too. And I wanted to emphasize that I'm not in any way involved in any sort of commercial interest. A particular stretch of speech that you'll hear, it lasts for about a minute or so, is a girl who's originally, initially speaking, and sort of without any alteration to the sound of their voice. And then the alteration is played to her, and what you'll notice is an immediate sort of change in her fluency. And later on, you know, sort of the device is switched off again, and immediately sort of the disfluency problems re-arise. Of a wo woman's handbag, the police were called and had arrived to ask her some questions. Um, 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 Mrs. McAlpin, please could you give us a, a clear and accurate it, 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 a description of the thief, including any unusual distinguishing characteristics. Please uh, be careful n not to omit any critical it, 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 it details, as these are probably the, the most important features that will help us to, who, to, to track down and uh, arrest and hopefully prosecute him. Of course, he was a young man, probably aged between 15 and 20. He was wearing a blue tracksuit. He had brune hair and wearing a cap. I think you're going to hear the that there's a clear change in sort of the fluency from when the device is on. Now, it's, I've put there a couple of other sort of warnings. Um, these sorts of e effects, you know, so some people are using them in prosthetic devices, but it's certainly not a cure for stuttering. And the right questions to ask, I believe, are how to use those effects for promoting fluency in the short term and how to sort of promote uh, carryover. Maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that later on. I selected a number of different sort of aspects of work, mainly sort of work that we've done at uh, University College. Uh, and are hoping to get through uh, these six different sort of components. Um, first off, dealing with diagnosis. Perhaps sort of uh, some people in the audience may be surprised it's not that easy to diagnose you know, sort of stuttering itself. Um, I'm going to show you just two different issues. One is uh, the issue about which of those symptoms in that list that we talked about should be considered the core symptoms, the things that really define stuttering. And then we'll look about, and so once we have a grasp with what we may or may not sort of feel is necessary to include, and so look at some of the issues associated with whereabouts we should put a threshold to say that a person scoring above this number of disfluencies is a stutter and a person below that number of disfluency is not a stutter. And remember that there are lots and lots of other effects besides speech as well. I do want to emphasise that. Here, I've broken up that list into you know, sort of the basic features and the core features. The core symptoms are those at the bottom, including the prolongations. And what are often considered normal on fluency, what a fluent child will show, are those at the top, phrase repetitions and interjections. I put a class, in the, class of symptoms in the middle, where there is a lot of disagreement between researchers and therapists as to whether these are a sign of, sort of a stuttering or not. Now, next, in a couple of years' time, in 2015, <coughs> There's going to be the standard sort of reference manual for psychiatric disorders, which includes uh, stuttering specifications. And they're going to have to take a position as to whether they consider whole word repetitions stutters or not. 
my own view, and it's a very personal one, and it's not shared by everyone, as I emphasise, is that whole word repetition issue is uh, settled, and I, th I don't think that they are core symptoms of uh, stuttering. And the reason, my reasons for that, as they are listed here, the fluent children often produce you know, whole word repetitions all the time. The whole word repetitions happen on function words, and as a consequence of that, taxonomically, uh, they're like the less typical sort of symptoms. They're like the, uh, the core symptoms occur on the content words rather than the function words. Another piece of work that's coming out of uh, China at the moment is to classify sort of brain patterns when a person's producing either the core symptoms, the agreed core symptoms, like the prolongations and so on, or you know, sort of the normal non-fluences, like the phrase repetitions, but then to see into which of those classes, you know, sort of automatic classifiers, would put whole word repetitions. And the, work, the results are quite unequivocal, that you put whole word repetitions in the normal non-fluency sort of categories as well. The thing we'll come on to later, is uh, a uh, an indication of prognosis of stuttering that excludes whole word repetitions. And I'll, I'll deal with that in a little bit more detail shortly. Second issue that I mentioned is the threshold. What should we consider to be a sort of a value below which a person's fluent, above which a person a sort of is disfluent? And what's commonly used by therapists and researchers is a threshold of 3%, three stuttered words out of 100. Um, this seems somewhat low. Um, all people, when they're under conditions of stress, will sort of produce more disfluences than when they're relaxed. Uh, so there's lots of sort of issues about that as well. And as well, sort of thresholds are arbitrary and are going to depend upon whether or not we include whole word repetitions as symptoms. And just on the next slide, and just on the next slide, I've just shown that, where we've got a, a two diagrams here, one with the bar that's set at a low level, and so which corresponds to 3% stuttering, say, and the number of people you call stutterers on the left or, uh, and non-stutterers on the right is going to differ relative to you know, so the bottom diagram where we've got you know, so the bar positioned at a higher value. Prognosis. This is where it kind of touches on sort of politics as well. I won't read the whole of this uh, quote because we're short on time. Uh, but uh, the critical thing, the thing that I've highlighted, is in the middle of this, uh, where these authors say it's not practical, possible, or necessary to put every child who stutters into therapy. All the economic conditions and emerging health policies, in fact, make this option more difficult to do. Now, and so the question is, to be able to do that, what you have to be able to do is to accurately predict which children are going to continue stuttering and which children are going to get better, either spontaneously or as a result of uh, treatment. So we need to know what the risk factors for stuttering are. And a classic sort of case, a classic case uh, that looked at uh, children in Newcastle upon Tyne from uh, in the early, just after the war, you know, so for 15 years. You know, so it took 1,000 children and followed them up for a protracted period of time, all that time, you know, so, and looked to see what sort of factors might predict you know, so which kids you know, so would continue to stutter and which would recover. And cut a long story short, and so the authors found very few reliable indicators as to you know, sort of what will uh, distinguish those uh, two groups. Other researchers, you know, sort of ourselves included, you know, sort of have looked at uh, the risk factors for persistence of stuttering. And a study with Steve Davis last year, we, we collected data with Wellcome Trust money uh, of children at age eight through to teenage. And at teenage, we determined you know, so whether they had recovered or persisted in the disorder. We then looked at the information that we'd had at age eight and saw which factors would predict you know, so the pathway that they took, which would persist, which would recover. And the only factor out of a range of uh, factors that we looked at that predicted persistence was a measure of severity, how severe their problems was. 
Uh, and the, the measure of severity explicitly sort of excludes whole word repetitions. So, you know, so the signs of suffering, if you count the, sort of the core symptoms without whole word repetitions, you know, sort of are really sort of uh, given us some indication as to likely path of stuttering, fulfilling uh, potentially you know, sort of that uh, requirement in sort of the year in Ambrose quote that we uh, saw earlier. Not only that, but of course you can get sort of one significant sort of predictor, but the level of prediction you know, sort of was pretty good. It was good um, at 80 percent sensitivity and 80 percent specificity. These refer to accuracy in saying a person who persists will persist and accuracy in saying a person who will recover will recover because you can jiggle those statistics if you, uh, if you wish, um, if you don't look at both sides of the coin. And that result has been replicated in a recent thesis by Suzanne Cook in, for German. I want to mention this study as well because I think it's a good study and one that's not uh, that well known, not that well cited at least. Um, this is a study from Switzerland, uh, not Sweden, um, and they looked at all the army conscripts and they gave them sort of quite detailed analysis, psychiatric sort of interviews. And they came out after the end of it, it was a very extensive sample. Uh, they did their statistical analysis appropriately. And they came out with some sort of factors that you know, sort of were quite unusual, that hadn't sort of been considered to be associated with stuttering uh, previously. Uh, so ADHD is one particular sort of factor there. And also, you know, sort of a history of sort of drinking in the family, both from the mothers and the fathers, you know, sort of seemed to be associated you know, sort of with uh, a like, higher likelihood of stuttering as well. And we'll come back to that sort of uh, later on. We looked at you know, sort of some of the sort of background factors that you'd look at in a clinic, and now we're going to move on to uh, some of the factors that tell us a little bit about the types of uh, characteristics of stuttering. And we'll start by looking at the currently very popular sort of biological status. And the two sort of big areas that are looked at in stuttering, and one is you know, sort of the likelihood of a genetic influence of stuttering, and the other of whether there's anything sort of different sort of happening in the brains of persons who stutter. So to take a very, very sort of quick look at heritability, Mendelian and non Mendelian transmission, you know, sort of and linkage studies as well. Um, the way that the linkage, sorry, the heritability is estimated, one way, is to use twins. And you have two types of twins, identical and non-identical twins. The identical twins share all their genetic material, the non-identical twins only 50%. And from these, you can allow an estimate of how heritable stuttering is. And one study, I've chosen a UK study, one of my ex-students, Katerina Dworzynski, she studied 14,000 twins and found that 70% you know, sort of, of the disorder was attributable to sort of heritable sort of factors. So there really is you know, sort of a big sort of... Uh, component sort of to do you know, sort of the genetic sort of makeup of the individual. And that, in fairness to the other people who I haven't put on this slide, you know, so that uh, is pretty consistent across all such studies uh, as that. Looking at sort of transmission, one of the classic sort of types of genetic transmission is Mendelian sort of transmission, where Mendel looked at uh, colours of flowers and saw uh, in what way you know, sort of the colours of the flowers you know, sort of were uh, passed on from generation to generation. And the fundamental sort of thing about Mendelian sort of transmission is you know, sort of that it brings about uh, his rules for uh, genetic transmission are that they sort of uh, associate sort of randomly. And early work suggested that there was possibly a sort of Mendelian transmission sort of mechanism uh, responsible for a uh, person who stutter. But that seems to be sort of wrong. Um, and so I'll just give you a couple of sort of facts here, the second of which is really telling. Now, so if you look at language disorder like stuttering, you'll find that more men stutter than women. But if you do take women who stutter, 
and you compare you know, sort of what happens to their children with men who stutter, the women you know, sort of are more likely to pass on the disorder to their children than are the men. And one explanation, kid's explanation of that is, in order for a woman to start stuttering, you have to have a higher dose of, you know, sort of whatever it is that is causing the stuttering. And once you've got a higher dose, you're then more likely you know, sort of to pass that on to you know, sort of subsequent generations. So that's non-Mendelian uh, transmission, what Kidd referred to as sex-modified. The most recent work on genetics has looked at linkage factors. Uh, and the work that's best known is by Dennis Drainer's group at NIH. And they studied a large Pakistani sort of family and included some further studies with, uh, with people from the UK, from the British Stammering Association. And, and so they were able to identify mutations in uh, two genes you know, sort of, that were, showed high rates in stutterers uh, than in non-stutterers. But none of, neither, it's important to note that neither of these particular sort of mutations necessarily inevitably led to stuttering as well. There's a bit of a surprising sort of factor in terms of these genes, uh, in the, the types of uh, processes that they control, the cleanup processes in cells as well. I want to mention a second uh, study, and this is a slide courtesy of Shelley Jo Craft. I'm, I'm sorry it's not as clear as it might be, but I think it potentially sort of links back to you know, sort of the work we saw on risk factors earlier on where, if you remember the adjective gross uh, study, um, I mentioned that two factors that had come out which were surprising were ADHD and alcoholism. And this group that Shelley Joe's uh, involved with and sort of identified the genes along, sort of shown along the top. And what she's done here is to show you know, sort of what the association and sort of with uh, other known disorders are as well. And you'll notice that on the left, ADHD, the center, alcoholism, and you know, so the right-hand side, you know, so the second from right, you know, so that some of these genes you know, sort of lead to alcoholism and, and so on as well. So there may be some sort of association there as well. Just throwing that out as a kind of speculative you know, sort of idea in these cases. Um, I just want to say a very brief word about you know, sort of brains and stuttering. Um, the studies that are coming out, so fairly consistently, you know, sort of that if you're dealing with persistent stutterers, then there seems to be you know, sort of part of the brain, the left brain, you know, sort of that uh, is showing sort of deficits, BA44, and it's responsible for uh, phonological sort of processing. Uh, and that's sort of come out now in sort of around about four to five uh, different studies. I do want to emphasize, though, that that is persistent stutterers. That's not recovered stutterers. Um, we're not looking at young children either um, in the, so a lot of these techniques are not really easily usable you know, so with young children as well. But persistent stutterers, there seem to be increasing evidence for some sort of uh, underlying states there. Biology is one thing, but there's also a big behavioural component to stuttering too. And I've just picked out sort of three different, uh, three different studies um, done by co-workers and, uh, uh, co-workers and students of mine. First off, sort of, there's an issue you know, sort of whether uh, people who stutter are bullied more than other people. And this is often sort of done by retrospective sort of reports of these, which from a psychological point of view is not um, the strongest type of evidence that you can get. But what Steve did was to go into the schools and look at this sociometric patterns, you know, sort of the linkage patterns between children in the classes. And from there, I was able to deduce, you know, sort of which kids were popular, which were bullied, and so on and so forth. And the stutterers came out as much more likely to be victims you know, sort of bullying. A second study that uh, will probably interest you is by Helen Blankensop, who's a clinical psychologist. Um, she looked at intrusive memories. Intrusive memories are the sorts of things that you get with post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. And she interviewed uh, sort of her 
population of a sample of children. Uh, and just uh, there was a lot more reported cases of intrusive memories in the people who stutter you know, sort of, than uh, in those you know, sort of, who are the control groups. Anxiety is often uh, associated with stuttering, and there's a big sort of question whether it's causative you know, sort of, or whether it's just you know, sort of an epiphenomenon. In the data that we've looked at where we've got divided divisions into sort of persistent recovered uh, speakers. And so we can look at separately the anxiety of the persistent and recovered speakers. And if speakers go on to recover, and so they start off anxious just as the persistent speakers do, and sort of but you know, sort of their anxiety sort of drops. So anxiety seems to go if your stuttering goes. <coughs> Want to mention because we sort of raised this issue earlier on, you know, sort of the issues of screening, you know, sort of that are coming up with the Every Child Matters initiative, and to be able to do that, we need some sort of method of being able to convert what clinicians do in their clinics and what health visitors will do when they're in their schools. And I think to be able to do that, you know, so we need to sort of make use of. Uh, extensive sort of databases where we can sort of assess you know, sort of the children for stuttering or assess them you know, sort of for uh, looking you know, sort of for, for, for screening you know, sort of at an early stage. Okay, I want to say something about uh, patient expectation. Am I okay for time? I'm okay for time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so we shall have plenty of time for questions. Um, uh, I want to say something about treatment and patient expectation too, which is a recent sort of topic that we started to uh, examine. And one of the things that sort of came out sort of immediately uh, was that there's little work on patient expectations, exactly sort of what is it, what it is that you know, sort of patients would expect uh, in therapy. It's also clear from individual sort of reports that uh, what their expectations are is extremely sort of diverse. So, you know, so what one person expects you know, sort of won't be uh, shared you know, sort of with the second person's. The master's thesis that was just finished this summer was conducted by Annick Landau. And what Annick did was to go and interview a set of children who stutter uh, and also their parents. These were interviewed separately. So, you know, so if the, so I'll give you some sort of samples of what happened sort of shortly. Uh, but it's important to realise that this wasn't sort of the kids just agreeing with the parents. They were interviewed quite separately and fin filled in sort of separate, separate, um, separate questionnaires and sort of reports of what they were doing and, and so on. And the two things that uh, came out of uh, Annick's work, uh, one thing was evidence-based. Uh, first off, the children and the parents of those children indicated that they thought that their children, you know, sort of when they had been treated, you know, sort of were too young to you know, sort of have benefited from that particular sort of training. Now, I'm emphasising that because that goes against a lot of, you know, sort of what's been said you know, sort of, uh, repeatedly. And it's, it's, I put it down as a received opinion. It's, it's just a question, just a view that I nor other people you know, sort of had not sort of questioned at all. Um, that's the idea, you know, sort of that early intervention is necessarily sort of a good thing. Um, you saw it you know, as well, you might have noticed in the Arian Ambrose quote where they said, you know, sort of once you know a person stutters, uh, therapy should not be delayed at all. But, you know, so in the examples we'll see you know, sort of in uh, the next slide, you know, sort of show you know, sort of some evidence that that's not the case. And we weren't seeking this information, so I hasten to add as well. Um, so we'll just go through a few of these. This first child who started therapy, aged four, later would have been better because I would have felt the need to improve. When I was young, I didn't know there was a different, more fluent way of speaking. I was happy stuttering. And his significant other, he was still very young, wasn't able to take on uh, some of the strategies. 
So, you know, so you see him there, you know, sort of the, the kids are saying, you know, sort of, maybe I could have benefited you know, sort of later on. And similarly, sort of with you know, sort of these other two children, you know, sort of the parent as well. We, we plan to follow that up in... We plan to follow that up in subsequent studies you know, sort of later this year. Um, but you know, so the important thing is it's sort of raising sort of questions about early intervention and suitability. And the second thing that Annick did was that um, she did a very thoughtful sort of discussion in which uh, she considered sort of the different issues associated you know, sort of with parent training and you know, sort of how they should be investigated. Um, they're, in many ways, the best position to be able to say whether the child's cognitive or whether it's, its understanding you know, sort of is appropriate to the particular sort of techniques uh, that uh, they are to be trained in. And so also the child, the parents know when the child, the time is during the day when the child is best suited to uh, be learning these things as well. I mentioned here, you know, so sort of Frances Cook. Frances Cook, for those of you who don't know, she's the head of the Michael Palin Centre, and she gave a talk at the Oxford Disfluency Conference this summer. And she raised the sort of serious question about you know, sort of the issues of devolving some of the things that that therapists currently do, you know, sort of to you know, sort of less trained sort of assistants, you know, sort of uh, within uh, the centre or whatever. And uh, she was saying, you know, so she did think that there were some things to, that could be devolved from you know, sort of the expert clinicians. And you know, so what I'm suggesting here, and this is not Annick's work, you know, sort of is you know, sort of that possibly sort of training regimes where you bring the parents in you know, sort of, and get them to sort of learn the skills you know, sort of, so they can pass them on to the children might be an appropriate thing to consider in this respect. The other point, point I made about this is, you know, so that in some of the uh, quotes that we've got here, you know, so there are lots of sort of different issues, you know, sort of not just about sort of expectations, but also about awareness of the problem too. Uh, so, you know, sort of in, at early times, you know, sort of that first child, you know, sort of doesn't appear to be able uh, to have identified you know, sort of that he or she uh, might have had uh, some sort of problem. Um, early intervention, you know, sort of if uh, it's uh, patient involvement, you know, sort of, um, it's often considered not to be sort of problematic because it's often stated that you know, sort of the treatments can't do any, any harm. Um, Looking sort of just through the literature, you know, sort of, that's not all that firm a conclusion you could draw. There is this sort of concept of iatrogenic uh, problems, and these are issues where, you know, sort of, the if you treat a particular sort of uh, medical condition, you know, sort of, it can have sort of adverse effects itself. Classic sort of cases are sort of giving people drugs when they don't need the drugs, but also applies to behavioural sort of techniques too. So I think that's a thing that we must be thinking about as a researcher, you know, so that we'll be looking into uh, as well. And another sort of question that I want to raise is uh, what parents of recovered children do. Um, they, when we see them sort of in clinics, they often... Uh, don't, uh, and we often see sort of uh, children sort of coming back to us, and uh, students sort of mention this as well, is that you get sort of people sort of coming who are not sure whether they've had treatment or parents saying that uh, they don't want their sort of children reminding that they have uh, stuttered if they've recovered from the sort of the problem. Okay, uh, just kind of wind up and sort of try and bring this back to uh, the original sort of title uh, of the talk that uh, I was offering. First off, you know, sort of the, the research and treatment you know, sort of that's been done sort of recently, I think is coming out with some sort of firm sort of facts and certainly telling us that stuttering is a sort of complex disorder involving biological you know, sort of, and behavioural sort of factors too. So we know a lot more than we did you know, sort of in uh, Logue's time. 
The film certainly has raised public awareness. Um, before, you know, sort of, there'd be half this number of people you know, sort of come along to uh, hear a lunchtime talk on stuttering. You know, sort of, now, you know, sort of, people are much, much more aware of the problem. Unfortunately, though, it comes at a time when economic policy, uh, in one way or another, you know, sort of, is leading to a situation where the resources that we would need commensurate to sort of further our understanding and treatment uh, of the disorders you know, sort of, are not there to actually sort of allow us to cash in on sort of this uh, increased uh, interest too. Um, and a particular sort of theme of mine, a particular sort of point you know, sort of that I want to, mean it, uh, want to make is that there is a need for more research that can make health service provision more efficient. So we saw this in sort of Yeri and Ambrose's quote, and we'll probably see that, you know, this being a big sort of theme at University College, you know, sort of with Malcolm Grant's sort of involvement in the commissioning uh, at chairing. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for this very thought-provoking lecture. We do indeed have uh, a couple of minutes left for, um, for questions. And here's the first one. Yes. I just asked two quick questions. You had a word on the um, slide handed there. So Yeah, I can tell you a bit about both of those. Handedness, if you took a population, uh, a sample of uh, people who stutter, and you looked at them relative to you know, sort of the fluent population, what you found is about 10% left-handers in the fluent population and 20% you know, sort of in uh, the sample of stutterers as well. So potentially sort of that's a risk factor for stuttering. Uh, it might be sort of tied up with sort of laterality differences as well. That's the, the often main uh, supposition on that. Uh, in terms of uh, devices, um, there's kind of a long tradition uh, of people trying to sort of have uh, come up with sort of techniques that sort of allow the sort of technique I d demonstrated there you know, sort of to be provided in a portable sort of way. Uh, a lot of it done in the UK, in fact. There's a thing called an Edinburgh mask, which was like uh, one of the old Walkman that you used to wear. Um, and sort of walk around with it. Also, uh, the uh, British Stammering Association, uh, they provoked, promoted a particular sort of device which you, know, sort of, uh, you wore, and if you spoke too fast, it kind of gave you a, a, a vibration to tell you to, to speak, to slow down, which I think is a lot of, a lot of good things about that, actually. Um, but probably the most uh, well-known sort of device is uh, the so-called so speak-easy device, which you know, sort of incorporates the faff effect. Uh, and that's marketed sort of out of North Carolina uh, by a company there. And it's very expensive for what it is. It's uh, $5,000 sort of dollars, uh, uh, which probably translates into £5,000 in this country as well. Uh, but some people do find it sort of useful for alleviating sort of the immediate symptoms. I did stress that, you know, sort of you don't, you'd only get sort of immediate effects. When you switch it off, probably the effects will sort of return. We have time for one more question. Nobody wants to be the last. Mm -hmm. As well. Okay. The lady in the, yes. Hi, uh... Thank you. I didn't see the film. Um, I read a long time before the film that it, his problem was produced by um, his, his being born left-handed and being forced to be right-handed in, in a right-handed world. Um, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, one of the things that I did look at when I was doing another version of a talk was to you know, sort of look at the family the families of the, the two children of George the Sixth, which was you know, sort of Elizabeth and Margaret as well. And there's an awful lot of 
and so there's children there as well. And uh, one would have expected if it was, there was some sort of heritability in that particular group, that there would have been significant numbers, you know, sort of, of uh, say, three or four, you know, sort of uh, children, you know, sort of in you know, sort of those families that would have started. Uh, so it certainly seems like you know, sort of, it doesn't seem to be associated you know, sort of, with heritability in that particular sort of case. And some other factor you know, sort of, might very well you know, sort of, be, be implicated too. There is a paper sort of coming out in laterality in the near future that looks at the sort of issue you know, sort of, of handedness and exactly sort of how it's implicated in sort of the etiology of the disorder and so in a lot more detail as well. Yeah. Thanks. I hate to cut this off. There will be another lecture in this room in two minutes. Um, so we do need to give um, time to file out and file in. Thank you, Professor Howell. Okay, thank you. <coughs>